Greetings. After moving around quite a bit over the past few years, we came back to Colorado for good about a month ago. We're finally starting to feel a little more settled in our new place, just in time for the arrival of fall, which happens to be my favorite season for cooking by far. Here are a few of my favorite cozy recipes I've made over the past week, plus a highly requested tutorial for homemade sourdough bread. I love to bake bread all year round, but this task becomes even more of a priority during the fall. As the weather cools off and we find ourselves enjoying more cozy soups and stews, we always need a good crusty loaf of bread for dipping or making grilled cheeses. So let's start off the week by making a super beginner-friendly sourdough loaf. If you've been wanting to try your hand at sourdough but it's all seemed a little too intimidating, this is a great first recipe to try. The key is to make sure your sourdough starter is very bubbly and active. Whisk it together with lukewarm water and then add bread flour and salt and mix it all up. The dough starts off really shaggy and kind of messy looking, but that's okay because over the next few hours, we're gonna develop its gluten structure through a series of stretch and folds until it's nice and smooth and elastic. Let the dough rest for 20 minutes before performing the first set of stretch and folds. Take the edge of the dough furthest away from you and stretch it upwards, then fold it over towards yourself. Then rotate the bowl slightly and repeat this three to four more times around the entire perimeter of the dough. And we're gonna repeat this process every 20 minutes for the first two hours of rise time. Each time you'll see and feel that the dough is becoming stronger, smoother, and more elastic. And if this is seeming like a lot of work, don't worry, each stretch and fold takes literally 30 seconds. It's super easy, I promise. After completing six stretch and folds in total, cover the dough and let it rise on the counter until it's roughly doubled in volume. Today it took my dough about six hours to do this, but it can rise faster in a warm kitchen and slower if your kitchen is particularly chilly. The key is to go by the way the dough looks rather than a strict time. Shaping bread is a whole art form in itself, but a super beginner-friendly method is to simply perform another set of stretch and folds to pre-shape the dough. Then turn it out onto a lightly floured surface, seam side down, and let it relax for 20 more minutes or so, and then perform the final shaping. And shaping is mostly about creating tension on the surface of the dough. It takes a little bit of practice, but the good news is even bread that looks imperfect usually still tastes amazing. So you can't really go wrong in my opinion. If you don't have a banneton, you can use a colander or a mixing bowl lined with cloth or parchment. Let that rise in the fridge overnight. And then to bake the loaf the following morning, preheat your Dutch oven in a 500 degree oven for about an hour. Score the dough with a very sharp knife or blade before baking. You bake the bread covered for the first 15 minutes and then uncover it for the remainder of the time to help it develop a beautiful dark golden crust. It's still cooking at this point and it needs to cool or you risk a kind of gummy texture that's not ideal, so trust me, it's worth the wait. In addition to doing a lot of baking and making lots of cozy meals, I've also been meaning to do a little seasonal decorating just to make our place feel more like a home. If you've been following for a while, you'll know that Eric and I have moved quite a few times. We just counted and we've moved six times since we've been together. And before this move, we were talking about how excited we are to finally plant some roots and we really want to nest. And I feel like the timing is perfect because it's autumn and it's the coziest season. And one of the first things that we wanted to do was finally get some high quality sheets for our bed. We've never invested in luxury bedding, so we were super excited when Brooklinen reached out to us to kindly sponsor today's video. Brooklinen makes sheets that are worth investing in. Not only will they level up your sleep, but they are super durable. They just keep getting softer and softer each time I wash them. When we put them on our bed for the first time, we could tell the difference immediately. You can just tell they're not your average sheets. We spent about a third of our lives in bed, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So it just makes sense to choose sheets that are tried and true. And aside from our friends absolutely raving about them, Brooklinen has over 100,000 five-star reviews, 
which is more than any other online bedding company. And aside from how soft and comfortable this bedding is, I think it's so beautiful. So we ordered the Lux Hardcore Bundle and we were able to mix and match designs and colors to create our perfect set. So Sarah let me pick the color of the sheets. I mean, we picked them together, like we were sitting next to each other doing it, but if it was solely up to her, the bedding and the entire house would be bright pink. So we went for a more neutral, darker aesthetic, and I really like them. Brooklinen has over 20 colors and patterns to choose from, so you can mix and match your pillowcases, your duvet cover, your flat sheet, your fitted sheet, everything. It's really cool because from the comfort of your own home, you can preview all the different combinations. These are really cool because the cover of the duvet matches the dark stripes on the other pattern we chose. So it was it was actually really fun like figuring out what would look best together. The Lux sheets that we chose are 480 thread count sateen, which makes them soft and smooth and a little bit on the warmer side. Which is perfect because I'm always running cold. <laughs> So if you want to upgrade your sleep and try out Brooklinen for yourself, you can get $20 off of any order over $100 by clicking on the link and using my code, Sarah's Vegan Kitchen. Goat thinks these sheets are very nice and we think you will think so too. <laughs> Thanks again to Brooklinen for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now, this wouldn't be a fall themed video without at least one tasty pumpkin confection. And this week, I think I finally perfected my recipe for vegan pumpkin streusel muffins. Truth be told, I was never the biggest fan of pumpkin growing up, but it does grow on me more and more the older I get, I think because it's such a nostalgic kind of thing. I do think it's better to make your own pumpkin spice blend rather than buying it because then you can tailor it exactly to your preferences. So for example, I don't love a strong clove flavor in mine, so I don't add much of that. This recipe uses a full can of pumpkin puree, which not only gives the muffins a super pumpkin-y flavor, but it also makes them extra moist and tender. So even though these are vegan, we don't need to add a separate egg replacer because the pumpkin puree is gonna perform all of those functions. The streusel toppings, a very simple combination of vegan butter, flour, sugar, and cinnamon. You just mix it all together till it's nice and crumbly and then add a heaping spoonful to the top of each muffin. And these get baked for five minutes at 425 to help the streusel crisp up. And then we reduce the temperature to 375 for the remaining bake time. And just like with the sourdough, I know it's really tempting to dig into these right after they come out of the oven, but personally, my favorite finishing touch is the glaze, which needs to be drizzled on after the muffins are fully cooled so that it can harden and add an extra satisfying element of crunchiness to the streusel topping. The weather has been starting to shift here in Colorado and we've had a few chilly days lately. And luckily there's nothing better than a tasty pumpkin treat and a strong cup of coffee on a brisk fall morning. I love browsing Pinterest for seasonal recipe inspiration, and the other day I came across this butternut squash gnocchi dish that looked so cozy and delicious, I knew I had to make a vegan version for myself. This was actually my first time buying gnocchi from the store. I used to make gnocchi from scratch all the time back when I was just vegetarian, and the recipes would typically call for eggs, so I guess I just always assumed that packaged gnocchi would too. But to my pleasant surprise, a lot of brands of store-bought gnocchi are plant-based, so I guess I've been missing out all these years. The original recipe calls for butternut squash puree, which you can purchase in a can or make from scratch, which is what I chose to do. Scoop out the seeds, brush the cut side with oil, and then pop it in the oven until it's tender. After allowing it to cool slightly, I scooped the flesh out of the skin and into a food processor and pureed it. Now onto our gnocchi dish. First, I started off by slicing up some hot Italian Beyond sausages and pan frying those until they were browned. Then I set those aside and sauteed a diced shallot and a few cloves of minced garlic until they were nice and fragrant. The house smelled amazing at this point. The fresh sage and thyme add that classic autumnal aroma that's just so comforting and nostalgic. And it's the combination of homemade cashew cream, vegetable broth, and the pureed butternut squash that makes this dish so velvety and creamy. 
The starch from the gnocchi also helps to thicken everything. And I actually think this butternut squash cream sauce would taste great with any pasta shape. I also wilted in some fresh spinach at the last minute, which I think was a good call. And I think sauteed kale would be a nice addition too. This meal was so cozy, so I highly recommend you try it out if you're looking for creative ways to use butternut squash. This is like the only pumpkin beer I actually like because it's not super strong IPA-ish. It's just a really nice pumpkin flavored beer from Upslope in Boulder. My best buddy Jeremy brought it over last weekend and I'm really happy about it. Sarah even likes it. It's so squishy. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good, honey. Mm. Ready to go on a nice evening fall walk. Okay, here is an autumnal spin on one of my all-time favorite salads. It's my kale crunch salad. And when I say that the salad is addictive, I'm serious. Like, I have been known to eat an entire batch to myself in one day. I love it that much. Recently on Instagram, on Pinch of Yum, I saw a tip to chop up kale using a food processor rather than by hand. This creates a really fine chopped texture and I thought it might also bruise the kale and have kind of a similar effect to massaging it. I was super curious to try this out so I chopped up both my kale and cabbage in the food processor and it definitely did tenderize the greens. It even mellowed out their bitterness a little bit. I think this would be a great step to take if you're trying to kind of trick yourself into eating more greens because it condensed them so much. Then I used one of my favorite recycled jam jars to whip up a sweet and tangy maple Dijon dressing. This calls for fresh lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, maple syrup, and olive oil. And this extra virgin olive oil by Graza is my absolute favorite for salads. The flavor is incredible. And to add crunch to the salad, I always toast up a handful of whatever nuts and seeds I have in my pantry. So this time I added slivered almonds and pumpkin seeds. You can also add your favorite fresh or dried fruit like chopped green apples, pomegranate seeds, dried cranberries. There is actually a pear tree in our backyard, so I chopped up one of those to add in this time. I just think the salad recipe is a great blank slate and I always have fun making it a little different each time. Got some sourdough bread and everything is so fine. I feel like it's gonna be easier to eat it with a spoon than a fork. A little bit of everything. That's a big bite. <laughs> a lot of fiber to chew on. I do like the texture, but I think I actually prefer it how I usually make it just like finely chopping everything. But I do think the food processor trick would be good if this was like a sesame ginger like peanut salad. I feel like it would work with the cabbage crunch salad that you make. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's good. The dressing's really good. For the longest time, I have been seeing people on social media make whipped feta, and they'd serve it as like a dip with roasted vegetables or crostini. It's one of those recipes that I've just been wanting to try for the longest time, but I haven't gotten around to it, and that happens to me far too often, so I've been making an effort to cross some of my recipes off of my to-try list. So today I finally decided to attempt a vegan whipped feta with roasted garlic herb potatoes. I use Yukon gold potatoes, which I think have the best texture when roasted. If you wanted to use those mini potatoes, I think those would come out really well too, and they're also super cute. And when I want my potatoes to come out crispy, I always start by parboiling them. Then this is key. Once you drain them, you wanna let them steam dry. So to do this, I prefer to pop them back in the pot on the stove, and the stove is off now, but the residual heat will help all the extra moisture evaporate from the surface of the potatoes. And once they're dry to the touch, that's when I toss them with olive oil, salt, pepper, and roast them until they're golden brown. When they're almost as crispy and golden as I want them, I take them out and I toss them with plenty of finely minced garlic and parsley and a little extra olive oil. Then I pop them back in the oven for about five to 10 more minutes. And adding the fresh garlic and herbs at the end like this helps prevent them from burning. In the meantime, let's try our hand at a vegan version of whipped feta. So there are a few store-bought vegan feta options that I think taste really delicious, like the ones by Trader Joe's or Violife. 
And all the TikToks I've seen combine the feta with either some Greek yogurt or labneh or cream cheese in a food processor. So I actually splurged and I got myself a container of my favorite plant-based yogurt by Kulina. This stuff is so good. I added a squeeze of fresh lemon juice, a little drizzle of olive oil, and a little onion and garlic powder, and just whipped it until it was smooth and fluffy. I have this little ninja blender that has a built-in scraper to keep everything moving even when the mixture's thick. It works really well for dips like hummus and also for smoothie bowls. I will say though, vegan dairy alternatives are quite pricey, so I would be interested to try to make a from scratch version of vegan whipped feta, maybe using tofu or cashews or some combination of the two in the future. This combination of the cool, tangy feta dip and the hot, crispy, herby, garlicky potatoes was so incredible, just addictive. I would love to try this again with roasted cauliflower or like braised cabbage wedges or maybe some roasted chickpeas. Honestly, 10 out of 10. Well, that concludes our first video back in Colorado. Thanks again to Brooklinen for sponsoring today's video and make sure to check out the link in the description for $20 off your order over $100 with my code Sarah's Vegan Kitchen. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon with more cozy fall recipes.